so now we're going to switch to Dave talking about K-12 spending, uh, and arguably the more important side of that is the achievement of what we're getting for all that spending in education. So Dave, take it away. Thanks, James. Uh, we're going to start with achievement. Um, some of you may have heard that can't, achievement in Kansas is among the top 10 states in the nation. Unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, Kansas doesn't have a single ranking in the top 10 of any measure of actual achievement. Uh, we're showing you here on this first slide the 2017 results from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, NAEP. Uh, this is run by the U.S. Department of Ed, and it's considered the gold standard of comparing state achievement. Uh, they test reading and math in the fourth grade and eighth grade, and what we're showing you here are the, uh, the percentage of kids who are proficient in each of those measures and the national rank, and we break it out by low-income kids and those who are not low-income. We do that, first of all, the, break at the, the definition of low income is the government says anyone who qualifies for free or reduced lunch, they consider to be low income. So it might not exactly track with income, but that's the separation. And the reason you look at these is that there are, in every state, very large achievement gaps, sometimes two to three years worth of learning between the kids who are low income and, and everyone else. And one of the focuses is trying to get those achievement gaps closed. So you track these separately, and what you see, for example, is fourth grade reading low-income kids. That's Kansas's best national ranking. It's ranked number 15, but there's only 24% of those kids who are considered proficient. Uh, that's because the rest of the country, uh, the average, is even worse than 24%. So the national ranking often on things like this really don't mean anything. It might mean something when you're talking about college football, but when you're talking about student achievement scores, I don't care what state it is, the national rankings are very deceptive. That's why we prefer to talk about actual achievement results. And so you can see that they're, on the NAEP they run anywhere from the mid-teens to the low 30s. Uh, the same thing basically applies to the ACT. Where now ACT doesn't provide breakouts based on income levels, they do uh, racial breakouts. And so we provide the three main ones here. White, uh, the score rank is number 24, uh, and 35% considered to be college ready. ACT, rather than measuring proficiency, measures college readiness. And their definition for college ready is that you have at least a 50% chance of getting a C on a college entrance course or a 75% I'm sorry I got that backwards uh, or on a B on a college entrance course so uh, these are not these are just entrance courses 35% of the kids in Kansas who took the ACT test last year and not everyone takes it of course but only a third of those kids were considered college ready in English reading, math, and science. Just 14% of the Hispanic students and only 6% of the African American students were considered college ready. Kansas has its own state assessment uh, and that changes the standards for it and the measurements change about every six years. Uh, this one's been in place uh, since 2014 but only reported since 2015 because of some technical issues they had. Uh, these are the 2017 results, and we've just showing you here uh, the percentage of kids who are considered to be college and uh, career ready, or at least on track to be college and career ready in the 10th grade. So we're showing you 10th grade math, and again, breaking out for low income and um, uh, not low income, the state average is 11% of sophomores who are low income are on track to be college and career ready in math, and about a third of the other students are on track to be college and career ready. Now, in Wichita, it's 8% and 29%. You can see we've provided some of the uh, local districts. Um, there's, this data is all available on uh, our Kansas Open Gov site, uh, but uh, that's how it lays out for some of the larger districts in this region. Now, We've been working with the legislature for years trying to get labels uh, that everybody understands so you can really understand how schools are actually performing. Uh, the Department of Education used to have a label like uh, meets standard or approaching standards. Now they put levels one, two, three, and four. Who knows what that means? Is level four good or is level one good? 
so we translated the uh, state assessment scores into labels everybody understands, A, B, C, D, F. There's actually about 20 states, legislatures in the country that have done this. Kansas is not one of them. Uh, so we decided this year we were going to do it ourselves. And all we've done is translate the state assessment scores using their guidance, their, their measurements. Uh, for example, level four, they say, is on track for college and career and has excellent understanding of material. So we said, okay, that's an A. Uh, the next level down, they have effective understanding and they're on track for college and career. We gave that a B. Now there's only four levels and there's five grades. So we took the bottom one uh, below grade level and said that's an F. And then the level two is, on tra is uh, at grade level but still needs more training and only has a basic understanding. So we just split that down the middle. The kids in the top half we gave a C and in the bottom half we gave a D. Uh, and this is how it lays out. So this is the grade distribution across the state uh, and you see in grades three through eight, grades three through eight and 10 are the only ones tested. So in three through eight, you see a pretty typical distribution. They're very large grouping of about 60% in the middle getting a C and about the same percentage getting a B and a D. Very few uh, Fs, only one A. And that was a, a Prairie Creek Elementary in the Spring Hill District in Johnson County. But when you look at 10th grade, you see a dramatically different distribution. Here you see 90% of the grades are either a C or a D. Uh, this is one of the things we hope to, that, that looking at it this way would help bring out for parents and legislators to understand. Why is there such a difference? There's no silver bullet single answer, but why is there such a difference in the test scores for the early grades as in the later grades? Uh, I've seen this across all states for years. Kansas is, is not an outlier in this regard, uh, but there's, there's something in there and we need to be looking into it. Uh, and by the way, you can see uh, there is a handout that lays out in the back that has every, there's 1,300 schools in Kansas and we've uh, applied a letter grade to each one of those. Uh, it's also online, you can see the URL here. It's a lot easier to read online. The print gets really tiny in the, in the handout. So here's the letter grades for the high schools in this region. We provided uh, all the, the big high schools in the Wichita district, their uh, C's and D's, uh, Derby and some of the others. The best uh, high school score in this region is Mays South High that got a B. And all we're doing here is measuring, again, the translating the scores for low income kids and those who aren't low income. Uh, for the, score, the subjects that are tested, and no weighting applied, just adding up all those. So in high school, there's, there's two uh, subjects, there's two uh, income levels, so there's four grades, and just taking the grade point average of those four and just translating it and applying it across the state. Now, we talked about the NAEP scores. Kansas started participating in the National Assessment of Educational Progress in 1998. And reading proficiency then was about 37% if you average the fourth grade and the eighth grade. It's still 37% in 2017, but spending has changed dramatically over that time. Uh, the uh, orange dashed line shows what spending would have been per pupil if it had just been increased for inflation. And it, went, it would have gone from about $7,000 per pupil to a little over $10,000 per pupil. Actually, it went from 7,000 to over $13,000 per pupil. Uh, that gets to whether spending more money really causes anything to change in outcomes. We'll touch more on that later, but I wanted to throw that up while we had the, uh, the NAEP scores. Now let's talk a little bit about funding. Uh, Kansas is very unique in how it distributes money to schools. 66% of the total funding comes from state government. The national average uh, is 47 percent. So Kansas has the sixth highest allocation of funding coming from the state in the nation. The national average for local is 45 percent, whereas Kansas only uh, provides 26 percent of funding from the local level. Uh, and this gets to, uh, and that's, so the, it, the irony is the schools are coming demanding and suing for more money from the state when the state is already providing uh, uh, one of the largest shares of funding in the country. 
and this is all census data. So now the, the, the state might have, well, the state, we'll get to that later. The state doesn't have an obligation to do that, but if it chose to, uh, one option would be to raise the local property rates uh, and get more in line with some of the uh, national distribution. This is the uh, kind of the same data, but it's just showing you over time how the trends have changed from 1990, which is as far back as the Department of Education can provide this state, local, federal breakout. So you can see that it's all grown, and you can see that the state piece has grown uh, the most. Now, let's talk about the per pupil spending. What we're showing you here is that um, 2017 set another record at 13,600, I'm sorry, I'm looking at 2018 here, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the Department of Education's estimate. The actual numbers won't come out until probably November of this year, but every year we get them to give us their estimate. They don't put it on their website, we just do it through an open records request. They said for the 2018, the school year just ended, they said it would set another record, they estimated at 13,647 per pupil, $9,113 from the state. Now, that's an important number to understand because media and sometimes school officials only talk about base state aid. Uh, that's only a portion of state aid. The total state aid is over $9,000 per pupil. Um, now, so in base state aid, it's also only a part, the reason that some schools say, well, that's all that should count because that's what we get to educate every kid. Uh, the reality is there's a lot more unrestricted money that goes to schools, over $2 billion just in two big pieces. Uh, one is the local option budget, that's about $1.6 billion, no restrictions whatsoever on that. And all the equalization money, um, there's about a half a million or half a billion dollars in equalization money. Again, no restrictions whatsoever. That's all in addition to base state aid. Uh, there's also other forms of aid that might be theoretically uh, restricted or seem to be restricted, but it's, it's not all restricted. So for example, at-risk aid, there's a tremendous amount of money spent on at-risk, which is dedicated for kids who are either uh, in poverty or academically at-risk. But the legislature allows school districts to use a good portion of that money, really however they want. So for example, it, they can say, well, we wanna use it to reduce class size, so we'll hire more teachers, and that will theoretically help everyone. And, and while the research says otherwise, uh, the, the important point is that doing that doesn't do anything specific for the kids that money was targeted for. And, and we did a study on this a few years ago that actually went through every school district's at-risk report and documented how a large, large portion of that money is not spent for the direct exclusive benefit of, of those kids. And, and it doesn't have to be because the legislature has given them that flexibility. So all that money really counts. Now, spending. Uh, here's something that it's amazing. A lot of parents don't seem to understand. They think the legislatures or the governors have decisions over how money gets spent. They don't. That's every decision is made by a local school board, whether it's who to hire, what computer to buy, what textbooks to buy, how much to pay people. Those decisions are all made by local school board members uh, and the administrators. It's all recorded according to official accounting manuals that are designed by the U.S. Department of Education and then adopted by state departments of education. So it's, it's for standardized reporting and comparison, comparing across. So what we're gonna show you comes from the official accounting manuals from the Department of Education. This is the 2017 data that we break out two ways for you. On the left-hand side, you're seeing how much the state average dollars per pupil. So out of the $13,236 that was spent in 2017, uh, almost $7,000, $69.93 per pupil was spent on instruction. And if you look over to the right, you can see that that equates to about 53% of total funding. So the, I'm not gonna go through all those individual numbers, they're there. Uh, but this is, uh, this counts all spending, uh, and it, the only difference is if there's capital outlay that can be counted as instruction, we, we still put that as capital outlay, so you can see because there's, there's some differences that go when you do this on a district by district basis, that can have a, a real difference. So we pull that, make sure that that's in capital, but um, 
over the years, this, uh, th this allocation, which is at the total discretion of local school boards, really hasn't changed. In fact, the allocation going to instruction has declined a little bit uh, by a, a little, uh, about one point, percentage point. It's gone down what's been allocated to instruction. Now, spending per pupil, again, this is the statewide number of, we saw 13,236 and 53% statewide average. Here's some of the data on the local districts, some of the, the bigger local districts in this region. And again, this data is all in one of the publications we have back there, the 20 education, uh, 2018 Public Education Factbook, and it's online. Let's debunk some spending per pupil uh, claims. Uh, I've heard, including some state school board members who, who really should know better, frankly, uh, that uh, accounting changes make it appear that school funding has gone up when it really hasn't. Uh, that's just flat not true. Uh, we go back, and, and don't take my word for it, go do what we did, ask the Department of Education, Dale Dennis, I'll give you his phone number and his email, and he'll tell you that there have been no accounting changes since 2005 that affected total aid to schools. Uh, CAPER, and 2005 is when they started including the CAPERS pension payments in school funding. So it wasn't included prior to that. Uh, but when we're showing you something over time, whether it's funding uh, by sources and so forth or how it compares to inflation, we've gotten the data from the Department of Education and restated the prior year's spending, so you're getting apples to apples. Those years in what we're showing you does include CAPERS. Uh, special education funding, there, there were some allegations made in the last election cycle that, well, special education didn't used to be counted. Uh, yeah, it was always counted. Uh, it's, it's always been done, and again, according to the Department of Education. The one change that has been t done uh, recently but doesn't affect total spending is how the 20 mills of property tax gets collected. The state mandates every district collect 20 mills of property tax for support of schools. But the legislature wasn't aware that that state money was not being recorded as state aid uh, until 2015. And that's when they made a legislative change so that in 15, it's finally, and that's about $600 million, so that since then, it's included in state aid. It always should have been, uh, but again, even though that changed, it didn't affect total aid to schools, which is what really mounts, uh, matters. One slide here on carryover cash reserves. You might have heard some discussion about cash reserves. And every government agency entity needs, just like we do as individuals, needs some cash reserves. Uh, how much is, is a matter of uh, uh, discussion. What this is showing is that in 2005, uh, and I'm really only focusing on what's in green. Uh, the green is operating reserves, the yellow is capital, and the bottom is, uh, or I'm sorry, the yellow is debt, and the orange is capital outlay. So kind of forget about those two and just focus on the green numbers. In 2005, schools statewide had $468 million in carryover cash reserves. That's largely state and local tax dollars that were given to schools to operate and educate kids and weren't spent in prior years. Now roll forward to 2017 and that number has ballooned to $928 million. So the increase is really what's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, that, that's about, that's almost double. That's over $400 million more of state and local tax dollars that were given to schools and they didn't spend it. They used it to increase their cash reserves. Now it was interesting when we discovered uh, that this phenomenon existed, uh, which was around 2010, uh, there were some really odd reactions from school superintendents. Some of them said, how what money? I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have any money. Others said, well, we had the money, but it's all spent. And still others said, well, we have the money, but we're not allowed to spend it. And there was a little truth to that because there were some restrictions on some of the funds. And once the legislature understood how much money was sitting on the sidelines, they then, over the course of a couple of years, started removing some of those restrictions. And, and, and allowed a large amount of that money, even if it was in theoretically restricted funds, allowed that money to be pulled out and spent for whatever they wanted to do. Very few districts took advantage of it, and those that did didn't really do much with it. Uh, so there's still, now, so you may have heard statements like, well, we, we did this because we were concerned the state was, was late on payments, and we were advised by the Department of Education 
uh, to hold back some spending and put it in the bank. And, and that did happen in 2009 and 10, I think, a little bit. But they're, they're, the state was maybe even to 11. During the recession, the state was a little bit late with some payments. But interestingly, I mean, that excuse doesn't hold water because most of the money was already set aside. They, they were setting some more aside, but the bulk of it was, was just was done in the past. Employment and enrollment comparisons. There's two interesting takeaways here. We're showing you, again, this is all Department of Education data. Uh, between 1993 and 2018, we've seen a 10% increase in students in Kansas and a 15% increase in classroom teachers. Now, think about the statements you've heard where about class sizes getting larger and larger and larger. If that's happening and you're hiring teachers at a faster pace than students are coming into schools, you have a management problem, not a funding problem. The, the, the student-teacher ratio has actually declined over the years, uh, and yet we have larger class sizes. Now look at the other two columns. Managers, and there's a description of what's included in manager. Uh, managers increased 36% over that period, and other non-teachers increased by 40%. Now, some of those non-teachers are like uh, paras and, and education aides, and they get counted as instruction. But now think about what you've heard about Kansas tax, uh, about teacher pay. There was a national study done that looked at all 50 states uh, by Ed Choice, and they found that if, uh, in the case of Kansas, if we had seen, say, a 10% increase in non-teachers matching the enrollment, Every teacher today could get more than a $10,000 annual pay increase with the money that you wouldn't have spent on all those other non-teachers. It's not to say it should have been happened that way, but it's to put in perspective that that's where an awful lot of the money in, at the choice of local school boards has gone. School funding lawsuits. Now we're getting into the fun stuff. Uh, there have been a lot of lawsuits over the last almost three decades now. I want to focus on a, a few in particular, starting with the one from 1994. That was USD 229 versus State of Kansas. The most important thing about this school decision was that's where the Supreme Court said it does not have constitutional authority to set funding levels. Let me repeat that. The Kansas Supreme Court in 1994 said it doesn't have constitutional authority to do what the current Kansas Supreme Court is doing. In 2005, a different court said, oh, yes, we do. And they ended up over a period of years uh, coming out in 2005 and ordering the state to spend another $853 million on schools. Uh, and it was, it was basically settled for $775 million, phased in over a three-year period. Um, the, and then in 2010, uh, the Gannon suit was filed on Election Day of 2010. So uh, in 2014, which was the first time the Gannon case got to the Kansas Supreme Court, they reversed course. This is basically the same court that in 20, 2005 said, you must spend money, and they said you must spend it based on this Augen, Blick, and Myers cost study. Well, in 2014, the Kansas Supreme Court told the lower court, you guys followed the wrong test. Here's this new test we want you to use. Well, the lower court did what the Montoy court said. So now the, the, the Kansas Supreme Court in 14 says no. Its adequacy is not just focusing on base state aid. The test for adequacy is when funding is reasonably calculated, all funding, so that students can meet or exceed what became known as the Rose capacities. And it said not just base state aid, count it all. And they also said, don't use the cost studies. They said the cost studies they used, which was the Augen, Blick, and Myers cost study and the legislative post-audit study, they said those studies are more akin to estimates than the certainties the lower court looked at. So, uh, and one of the reasons that we believe they came to that conclusion was because that cost study, that Augen, Blick, and Myers cost study, wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. Because Caleb Stiegel, who's now a Supreme Court justice, although he's recused himself because he was the governor's uh, chief counsel uh, for a while, Caleb was a KPI scholar. 
in 2009, he did a legal analysis of that Montoy study, and what he discovered was that Mont uh, Augenblick and Myers admitted in their report they deviated from their own methodology. They were supposed to say, here's what the numbers would be based on the districts that are both academically successful and cost efficient. They said, well, we're not going to use the cost efficient part because, quote, that might preclude the possibility that those schools were successful just because they spent more money. I added a little emphasis there, admittedly. Just because they spent more money. So they gave consciously inflated numbers. It was not based on those who were academically successful and efficient. Well, that's been out there. We've been pushing that information pretty hard. And while Caleb's excused uh, from, it recused himself, maybe somehow some of the justices became aware of this. We don't know. Uh, but, so they said, more akin to estimates. Now what's happened? Um, oh, one other thing. The, 20, the, the legislative post audit uh, that schools and courts and media often say, well, the legislature's own study said it ought to be this. You only have to go to page two of the legislative post audit study to see where it says this information is not intended and shouldn't be used to set funding levels. It was just an exercise for the legislature based on the set of variables the legislature gave it to run its audit. Give us different variables, we'll give you different numbers. They also said we weren't asked to and so we didn't attempt to figure out what those numbers would be if we took efficient operation of schools into account. That study has also been used to, to reference a correlation between spending more money and achieving more. And they did say, looking at state assessment scores in the period they looked at, that they found a very high correlation between spending and achievement. But the people who are saying that that's in there aren't telling you that later in the report it said, but the academic information on this uh, correlation is mixed. There are a, there's a large body of research that says there's a correlation and there's a large body of research, that's, re research that says it's not. More study needs to be done on this. The other thing that's important to know is that they only found their correlation when they looked at the state assessment test and that's all they were asked to do. Had they applied their same approach using the ACT scores or the NAEP scores, they couldn't possibly have found any kind of correlation because those scores weren't changing. It was only under a certain circumstance and one other thing while that was happening and we don't know whether LPA was aware of this or not, the Department of Education had changed its standards during that period. They had actually lowered the cut scores pretty significantly. We don't know whether LPA was told about that, whether they were aware of it, but we know that that was part of the reason it was appearing that there were, there were some improvements in those periods. So now let's look at, uh, we've got a couple slides here to talk about what happened last night. Uh, the court said the equity uh, arrangements are fine, uh, but there's just not, still not enough money going in. They said that uh, the, the, the base amount they thought was, was maybe not enough, they want inflation. Uh, there, there, were, uh, there is an allocation for inflation once the uh, funding increases over five years uh, is done. But basically what the court is saying, they want increases on the increases. Uh, even though they're adding over $100 million a year, they're saying, well, you still ought to give us some inflation on last year. Um, and, and they also told the court uh, or told the legislature that they must pass new legislation next April or by next April, and they've already scheduled oral arguments next May on, on what they came up with. Uh, and, and this is, you know, the, the court's trying to get away. Now, remember in 2005, they said you will spend $853 million. And so they took a lot of heat for that because even their brethren from 1994 knew they couldn't do this. They don't have constitutional authority. The authority to appropriate is solely vested in the legislature in our Constitution. So there have been some what we call the Goldilocks games where they're saying, that's not enough. We're not telling you how much. There's some broad hints over here. But keep coming back, it's not enough. Keep coming back, it's not enough. Well, now, $854 million over six years isn't enough. Keep coming back. That's still trying to tell the legislature how to spend money. 
So cost studies. There's another report in the back that talks about cost studies. Uh, when the legislature hired uh, West Ed to do its cost study that came out saying you need to spend upwards of $2 billion more, uh, we hired someone to do a peer review of it. And the legislature hired someone to do a peer review as well, and, but they only had, I mean, the guy had maybe a couple of days to really do a peer review of, of this really extensive cost study. We hired a national expert to do a peer review and look at it exhaustively. And, and here's some of the reasons he said not just this study, but any cost study cannot, should not be used to set school funding levels. First of all, there's a lot of information that the estimators simply don't have access to. They don't have access to all of the input prices. Uh, what, is some, what are they spending on all the different aspects, whether it's pay and computers and supplies and everything, uh, as well as what could it cost? What are the options? They don't have input uh, information on understanding exactly how inefficient schools are operating. They don't have information on the input data for other, in, other things that affect, like for example, um, uh, the degree of crime that might be in a neighborhood, the degree of parental involvement in one district versus another. They just don't have access to that information. Uh, and, and so that's one of the reasons you just really don't have an ability to control. Here's another thing. And this is, I'm going to read this because it's a direct quote. For cost function analysis, best practice requires researchers to adopt appropriate modeling and estimated estimation strategies and to check carefully for robustness and reliability of results. That's from a 2011 study, uh, Gronberg, Jansen, and Taylor. Taylor, in that study, is the Taylor that authored the West Ed study. But Dr. Scafidi found she did not include any of these best practices, now maybe because she was under a really tight deadline to turn something around for the legislature, we don't know. But the very things, checking for robustness and reliability of the data that she herself recommended in 2011 was not part of the West Ed cost study that the legislature w was given. Let's talk about efficiency. Uh, that West Ed study said they found the Kansas school districts to be very, very efficient. That does not mean what most of us think when we think of efficiency. What they were talking about, it's a comparison of outputs. So for example, um, the, and this, is, this data per pupil is using current spending. So this doesn't include capital and debt. Um, the state of Illinois had 86% graduation rate in 2015 and spent almost $14,000 per pupil. Kansas had the same graduation rate but spent a little over $10,000 per pupil. Therefore, Kansas is more efficient than Illinois because it produced, if you just do the math, one graduation point you know, per dollars, how many dollars per graduation point per student. That's what she was looking at. It's a comparison of cost per unit of output. She wasn't looking at are they efficiently organized, like having 286 accounting managers or transportation managers or anything else. She wasn't looking at are they getting the best possible price for everything they're spending. That's not what that study said. It's how it's been portrayed uh, and consciously portrayed, frankly, by a lot of folks who know better. Uh, it's not to say that Kansas schools couldn't achieve the same results at better prices. Now, uh, spending and, and achievement. What you're looking at here is a map. It's an old 2009 NAEP map. Uh, at green is good, uh, yellow is, is okay, and orange is the worst. So if you just look at this, you might say, well, the states in the north have overall have much better outcomes. And so a bivariate analysis, looking at two variables, would suggest that somehow proximity to the Canadian border must have something to do with better outcomes. That's why social scientists don't put much stock in these bivariate, two-variable analysis. Well, we spent this and we achieved that, therefore A must have caused B. That's nonsense. What all other factors can come into play? Um, so here's another example, another way of looking at the data. This is from 2015 uh, NAEP data, um, and it's looking at fourth grade reading for low-income kids. 
there were uh, eight states that all got between 21 and 22 percent proficient on, on that test. One state spent, New York spent almost over $24,000 per pupil total. Three states spent less than half that and got the same results. 18 states, on this measurement, 18 states spent less than Kansas and got better outcomes. No matter how you look at the data, it never says spending more money causes better outcomes. It's just not there. Um, this is to set up the next slide. This is looking at three states over time per pupil spending for uh, Kansas, Florida, and New York. And you can see uh, New York is the orange one on top, topped out at 22745 uh, in 2015 uh, versus uh, Florida is around 10 and Kansas was uh, almost at 13,000. And you can see that there's been a very, very strong upward growth for New York uh, and a little bit different. Florida actually really did have some declines. Now look at this. This is in the uh, Dr. Scafidi's cost study analysis. Um, and it's comparing the change. And again, this is for 1998 to 2015. Um, this is where we have the last, last year we have data for both achievement and spending per pupil. Um, and, and this is looking at the Florida, uh, um, so this is cut off a little bit, but this right here is Florida. So Florida had a 4% real increase in spending, inflation adjusted, a 4% increase and saw a 30 point gain, not percentage, a 30 point gain on this test score. Uh, and 10 points is considered about a year's worth of learning. So the fourth grade low income kids in reading in Florida gained three years worth of learning over that period. Kansas had a 39% increase in real adjusted spending and got two points. The national average was 24% uh, gain in spending and a 14 point gain in uh, results. Look at New York, a 45% increase in spending, they got 14 points. There's example after example after example in that study. Whether you look at total dollars spent, you look at how much things have changed over time, there is no proof. There is lots of proof that spending more money doesn't cause anything to change. That's not the way to go about it. Uh, this is, and now that was 2015, because we, we wanted to compare apples to apples with spending and achievement. In the 2017 results on NAEP, uh, without looking at the numbers, the important thing to understand with this is if you looked at this in 2003, these eight measures, Kansas won six of them compared to Florida and tied once. In 2017, Florida wins six measures and ties once. It's completely reversed itself Florida didn't have the spending gains. Florida isn't spending anywhere near as much as Kansas, and yet it's passing Kansas on most measures. Last two slides. Uh, this is on some public opinion polling we did. The first one, uh, and this goes back to last November, we asked voters, uh, and this was registered voters, Survey USA did this for us. Uh, what do you think about all this information, what's going on with the constitutional amendment and, and school funding? Uh, 59% of voters said they want to change the, the Constitution so that judges can't set funding. Only 20% said they want judges to continue to set funding, and 21% weren't sure. And by the way, this is almost identical data, because we have the breakouts and it's on our website. Uh, this is the average. Didn't matter whether you were liberal, moderate, or conservative, self-identified, Number one response, change the Constitution. They don't want judges setting funding. The other thing, uh, the second one I'm showing you here, and this is the last slide, is voters want schools held accountable for improvements at the building level. 70% um, of, of vote registered voters said the legislature should change the school funding formula so that there is a consequence at the building level for not improving outcomes. And, and that's important for two reasons. Number one, understand that voters really want schools held accountable. And number two, they never have been. There is, when, when schools talk about accountability, that's we have to write a report. 
we might have to go appear before a legislative committee. Nothing changes. Uh, the, uh, in the current law that was just passed, there in theory is this consequence of if you lose your accreditation, well then you have to go appear before the legislative committees and you have to write reports. But the Department of Education, or the state school board rather, is making sure that that really won't ever happen because they no longer accredit buildings in Kansas. Now they just accredit districts. So you can have a really, really lousy building in your district, and if all the others are just kind of okay, then that building is fine. And, and I'll close with this. We asked the Department of Education, so when was the last time that a building in Kansas lost its accreditation? They didn't know. It just doesn't happen. Without accountability, we're not going to see things change. So, James, let's open it up for questions. Stephen Ellis. There you go. Stephen Ellis, uh, running for the 7th and 4th House District. Um, so it occurs to me that I just want to tell the Kansas uh, Supreme Court to, to get them and to just oppose their ruling. What is your best guess on what would happen if that, if that were to happen if the legislature simply didn't follow their ruling? Well, first of all, uh, not following their ruling is, is actually what the, this Supreme Court kind of recommends. There was a 2015 Kansas Supreme Court ruling uh, where, where they found something unconstitutional, the legislature passed, because the legislature tried to get into the court's business. Uh, local judges had gone to the legislature and said, look, we'd like to elect our own chief judges instead of having the state Supreme Court appoint them. The court said that's unconstitutional, that's our prerogative, and further, very indignantly, they wrote that when one branch of government interferes with the constitutional duties of another branch, that branch has a duty to resist. They're basically saying, legislature, you have a duty to resist. We double-dog dare you, and we'll threaten to close schools if you do, but in that regard, they're threatening to break the law themselves because there's state law that says courts may not close schools. So what would happen? Uh, I, I think, first of all, my opinion, that's what needs to happen. Because, I mean, the court itself laid it out. There is a separation of powers doctrine that must be upheld. When people say we must uh, follow the rule of law, well, the rule of law includes the separation of powers. And so the legislature and the governor should step up and say, thank you for your opinion, we'll take it from here. They don't have the authority to close schools. Uh, and, and, you know, there's threats like we're going to hold legislators in contempt. How do you do that when the legislature isn't party to the suit? The state is party to the suit, not the legislature. Any additional questions? Again, don't be bashful in asking or in raising your hand. Thank you. Uh, David Babish, I'm not running for anything. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Supreme Court doesn't know how much we should spend. The legislature doesn't know how much to spend. Probably the closest would be the local school board. So, uh, so they hired an expert. The legislature hired an expert, and the expert said spend this much money. How do you, how do you counter that? Well, as I said, no, that's a great question. Uh, and, and that's why we had uh, a renowned national expert do a scholarly review of that cost study. Uh, those cost studies aren't worth the paper they're printed on because the people doing the studies don't have access to all the information. You cannot uh, account for so much of this is, well, how do you want to run schools? You know, what does it cost to run? Uh, one of the reasons, for example, that Florida can spend less, they have 67 school districts. Florida has four times the student, or five times the students as Kansas, but Kansas has four times as many school districts. Now, that's not a case for consolidation, but there's things that's going to have an impact. So one of the things, for example, the legislature could do it, and, and by the way, there's even higher public support for this, is provide non-instructional services through regional service centers. So, and, and this is what some states do. Uh, there's ways you can reduce those costs. A cost study 
can only make an and, and, and then think about the absurdity. Um, the West Ed cost study said, well, you're at 86% graduation rate. So if you want to get to 92 or 95% graduation rate, well, you need to spend this much more money. That's one of those bivariate analysis. My home state of West Virginia has a 90% graduation rate. And I guarantee you, you don't want the student outcomes that come with that 90% graduation rate. Kansas has 29% uh, of students overall college ready on the ACT. West Virginia has 19%. You, you can look at the, these bivariate analyses, and that's all it is. I mean, you might as well say, in fact, one, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan one time looked at a map like I showed you, and he very tongue-in-cheek said, well, obviously, Congress, the way that we solve our funding, our achievement problem in, in the United States is get schools to move closer to Canada. Those cost studies just can't take everything into account. All they do, as Dr. Scafidi says, is report what's being spent today and assume that we're getting everything we can possibly get out of what we're spent today. And that's just not true. Um, hey, Paul Wagner again from the 104. Um, I wonder, do you have the data as far as how private schools in Kansas do as far as on test results? And then also the question as to, Kansas has an, a notoriously weak charter school law as far as uh, better charter school ability would somehow affect overall uh, performance? Yeah. So on the first question, Paul, uh, the, there are a number of private schools in Kansas that take the same state assessment test. And so we've, there's an article on our website from a couple of months ago where we compared, because all of the Catholic schools take the state assessment test. So we were able to compare their average with uh, the public averages and, and doing apples to apples, doing low income to low income. Uh, and the Catholic schools tend to do, not tend to, in every case they do far better uh, than the district, the public district. Uh, and, and that's not just in the last year. That's, that's a trend that has been, we looked at it uh, under the old assessment, and, and they were getting much, much better. Uh, and, and by the way, not getting court-ordered funding increases, of course. Uh, but um, now, why is that? Well, they're different. Uh, they don't have uh, a lot of the, I mean, think about, a, a, you know, the public, the private schools will tell you, well, we don't have all this bureaucracy. We don't have a lot of the regulations we have to deal with. Well, then maybe the public schools ought to get rid of some of that. Uh, it's obviously not helping anything. Uh, so, yeah, the, 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 I, I can't say private schools overall, but we can certainly talk about the ones um, and, and that, that are, they're doing that, and you can see that article in the KPI. Now, your other question was charter schools. Yeah, Kansas has a really weak charter school law. It's uh, every year there's, there's national uh, comparisons of uh, school laws that are done, and Kansas always gets an F. Uh, and, and it's because partly because what's in our Constitution uh, and the, the way the charter school was written, it says the only way that a charter school can be authorized is if the public school district approves it. So think of it this way. I, have, I want to open a Burger King. I have to go get McDonald's permission to, to open it. It's not going to happen, and that's why we don't have them. Uh, public charter schools, uh, they, they are public schools. They get, I mean, charter is the shorthand. They are public schools, but they get their charter allows them to jettison some of the flug some of that administrative bureaucratic stuff that gets in, that they think gets in the way. It allows them to choose to do instruction and academic uh, functions the way they want. Uh, and, and so there can be a specific charter mission. But yeah, that would be a big improvement for Kansas. But uh, our schools and our state school board will not allow that in Kansas. So that's something that legislatively and constitutionally needs to be changed. Last question right over here. My name is Katie Jackson. I'm just a voter. Just a voter. Don't say Jackson. I, no, that was um, So I wanted to address, you mentioned um, wanting to understand the gap between the fourth and eighth grade assessments and the high school assessments. Um, and I just read a study not too long ago about how um, when American students um, were offered financial compensation for every correct answer they got on a state assessment, 
Uh, they performed in parallel uh, with Japanese and Chinese students who were given the exact same assessment. Um, and so I was just curious if you had any concerns about maybe the viability of that assessment data and whether or not it may just be that our 10th graders do not have any intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivation for that matter to take those um, and whether or not we should actually be using those to make these kinds of uh, these large scale assessments and additionally when we have the terminology college and career readiness as the target goal how are we assessing career readiness um, and I mean do we have any methodology for that at all and should we be factoring that Sure. So there's three questions there, and I'm, you're going to test my memory to see if I can recall all three, so you might have to help me. First of all, on the validity of the assessment scores. Um, so um, there, um, to the extent that there, there are some students might not be motivated to do it, that's going to be universal, uh, whether it's one district to another or one state to another. Uh, and so you can still, even if, there, even if motivation, let's say, is suppressing in this country versus another country, uh, we're talking about comparing Kansas to other states. We're talking about comparing one district to another district. So that wouldn't really be any kind of a factor. Uh, now, in terms of uh, having, uh, you're saying, what if there was uh, some kind of inducement, would they do better? Was that your question? Uh, or just whether or not it's a tool that is um, something that students would be motivated to take. Oh, the state, okay. So. Right, and, and that's all set by the Department of Education. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they're the ones who decide um, what qualifies as college and career ready. Uh, they decide what the cut scores are, what the questions are, and so forth. Uh, what we're, where we see the validity, I mean, regardless of whether you could say, well, if you ask the question differently or if you had set the standard differently, you might get a different outcome. The important thing is we're still seeing very low levels. And these levels track. So, for example, we had 29%. If you look at uh, uh, ACT scores, all students uh, in Kansas who took it, it was 29% were considered to be college ready in English, reading, math, and science. Now, look at the state assessment data. And we're seeing uh, there uh, about a third of the, a little bit less than a third of the students in the 10th grade on track to be college and career ready. When we're looking at in the old days um, where Kansas, now it's all in college and career ready, the previous assessment was on proficiency levels. And before they reduced this, the performance standards in 2002 and 2006, prior to that, the, the numbers reported for proficiency on the state assessment was very close to the proficiency levels on the NAEP scores. So there, there is, uh, I, I think there's enough comparability to, to you can make some judgments on it. Uh, any, you can always change it and so forth. Uh, one thing I'll add on um, the um, motivation, uh, that's up to parents and school boards to start providing some of that motivation. Uh, classic example, in the Kansas City School District, there are five high schools. Four of them on our A through F get Fs. One of them gets B's and C's, and that's Sumner Academy. And the difference between Sumner Academy and the others is that the, in order to go there, it's public high school, in order to go, the kids have to have a certain GPA. They have to have good attendance, and they have to have good behavior. And when they get in, that all has to be maintained, or they go back somewhere else. Raise the expectations. I mean, the expectations that uh, I had when I was in high school, the things that kids routinely do today, um, we, wouldn't th we wouldn't even think of trying to get away with when I was in high school. And I'm telling my age a little bit, but of course we didn't have cell phones then. But if we did, check them at the door or we'll take them and you won't get them. I mean, we just, we put up with too much uh, in schools today. And that's all under the control of the state school board. Thank you, Dave. Thanks.